Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so glad you could join us. Uh, take some time uh, out of your uh, out of your very busy schedule, uh, so we can have some time to uh, just sort of have some conversation together, learn together, uh, and then hopefully um, grow uh, a little bit professionally, perhaps in reflection. Um, and I, I just want to welcome you. Many of you have been participating in the the chat so far. I really appreciate that. Um, the chat will be a feature that we will use several times um, over the next hour. Uh, and my hope is that you'll use not only the chat, but also the polling that, that I've included throughout the, uh, our time together. So that way we can have some level of interactivity. Um, we have about 20, 21 uh, folks uh, that are joining us today. Um, and, uh, and so, um, I will be certainly sticking around uh, after the session is over if you have any other follow-up questions or if I can be of help in any way. Uh, but please uh, take advantage of the chat box. Uh, please participate in the polls. Um, I like to think that uh, the, more, the more you put in, uh, the more we'll get out uh, as we spend our, the next hour or so together. Also, um, I do just want to let you know that this session is being recorded. Uh, so that way, when the uh, session is over, uh, you will receive a, a copy of the recording. You'll also receive a copy of the uh, chat text. Um, so if anything's said in the chat, you, know, you don't worry about writing that down. You'll absolutely get uh, a copy of that, uh, as well as a copy of the slide deck uh, that we're about to work through together. Uh, so I just want to welcome you. Our, our first chat uh, box question here is what is one unexpected lesson that you've learned professionally throughout this quarantine experience? Some really great um, dialogue happening in the chat box. I just want to call out a few of those things. One of the, the very first answer or response there was less is more. Um, and of course, that can apply probably to a lot of things, but that's uh, um, certainly a, a, a very uh, good observation. Um, talking, there are some folks talking about getting used to technology, about um, having some sort of empathy for students that are in a different place te uh, technologically. One person mentioned uh, that uh, they really learned that, that uh, a lot of this technology is really within their grasp. Um, so um, really the focus for today is going to be uh, really uh, thinking about what have we learned over the past three months or so, and then specifically how can we move that forward into next school year. Um, and as, certainly as teachers um, and as educators, and if we have any administrators with us, um, you know, one of the things we always like to capitalize are, are teachable moments. And so really the past three months can really think, you can think about that as a teachable moment. What have we learned? And then more importantly, how can I use that to improve uh, my practice going into next school year, uh, whatever uh, that next school year happens to, uh, to look like. Uh, and certainly drawing in parents um, is certainly another element that we'll talk about uh, today. Uh, and, uh, as part of our series over the next couple of days. So uh, my name is Michael Corey. I'm a consultant with the Educational Service Center of Northeast Ohio. Uh, and today, today is really session one, uh, Lessons Learned from Quarantine. It is a precursor to session two, uh, which uh, my colleague Jennifer Morgan and myself will be putting on tomorrow, uh, same time uh, on the Zoom call, uh, talking about how to prioritize instruction. And then uh, my other colleagues, uh, Kelly and Chris, uh, will be finishing up um, on Wednesday with session three focused on feedback and assessment. And really the goal of the, over the next three days uh, is to focus on not only what have we learned, uh, but also how can we translate that forward in the next school year. So that, that is really uh, one of the big um, focus elements for us to, to be together. Um, I do want to talk just very quickly. This is not so much for us right now, although these are good practices to have now. Uh, it's also uh, something that you can think about moving into your classroom. Now, you have the past three months to draw upon, and, and you may not be using Zoom. Maybe you're using Google Meet. Maybe you're using Google Classroom. Maybe you're using Microsoft Teams. Maybe you're uh, using some other technology. So um, really, this is for any sort of distance learning, blended learning scenario. Um, in Zoom specifically, we have the option to raise hands. If you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, you'll have um, so, some reaction buttons that you can use. Uh, sometimes you may want to do this if you're not able to hear. Um, thumbs up for I understand. Some of these non-verbals that maybe you may not be able to pick up uh, when you're looking at someone's face. 
Um, some, sometimes it, it's good to have uh, one person as a moderator. So if you have the ability to have someone else who's able to, to be on the session with you, that's great. I also know a lot of times that's not the case. Uh, so whether you're doing a large group uh, sort of presentation, maybe you're meeting with a small group, um, if you can have someone join you, if you perhaps you have a co-teacher, or maybe you have somebody who's able to be uh, on the session with you, that's helpful. Um, I'm flying solo today, so I'll be manning the chat box. I'll also be uh, talking about content. Uh, and so I'll do my best uh, to, to handle all those things. But if you can have a moderator, that can be helpful. Of course, utilizing your camera is a really valuable experience when you're doing some sort of distance learning, uh, any sort of distance meeting. Um, it's the one advantage you have over just a plain phone call. And if you've ever been in an IEP meeting uh, where you're trying to meet together on a conference call, uh, and, and, and in my time, I've done quite a few of those. I have a background as an administrator. I've, I've done lots of IEP meetings over the phone. It's just you lose something. Uh, in the communication process. So if you can have your camera on, use that, uh, mute your mic if you're not speaking. Uh, and so uh, I have a setting where you, you were all automatically muted when you entered the room. Um, it just keeps background noise to a minimum. Um, I think it was last week or the week before uh, my three-year-old came in, uh, somehow found his way into the room I was in and was very excited to show me his camping lantern. Uh, and yes, that was an exciting topic, but uh, you never know when unexpected is going to happen in the background. Um, and of course, utilize the chat. Uh, I can't emphasize enough that we want to be as interactive as possible. And when you have a larger group, it's not always uh, the best uh, for us to be able to ask verbal questions, but uh, certainly the chat is a way to not only ask the question, but it's also a way for uh, me to follow up, uh, even if I can't do it in the session, I'll certainly do it afterwards, or for you to communicate back and forth with colleagues as a record of our conversation. And certainly if there are some great ideas that are shared and you share them in the chat, then that gets recorded and everybody has access to, to that at a later time and can hopefully benefit. So those are some of the norms. Um, I do want to start off with a poll. Um, this is one of those one-way communications uh, up front We'll get some sort of response. Uh, and I'm kind of curious to know what audience, uh, who we have joining us today, uh, kind of what levels uh, you are at. So I'm going to launch a poll here, uh, and you'll be able to respond. And if you are serving multiple grade levels, you, you can choose all that apply. You don't have to choose just one of them. Uh, and what I'm doing on my screen is I have the ability to see what the progress of the poll is, how many people have responded so far, uh, and that'll give us a rough idea. And then as soon as the poll is finished, I'll be able to turn around and share those results with you. Uh, something you should know is that in general, I run anonymous polling, so you don't, not that this really has, you know, any concern with, with anonymity, uh, but uh, I generally run polls, so they're anonymous, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, who, who said what, I certainly don't know those. Uh, it's really to benefit all of us as a group. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and shut the polling down here in three, two, one. And now I'm gonna turn around and I'm going to share the results. It looks like a uh, majority uh, of folks um, are uh, at the pre-K through four level. Uh, we do have some uh, intermediate grades, middle school folks, high school person, uh, or a few people there, and some district level people, or perhaps ESC people. So um, that's something that uh, it's good to know who, who we have together. It looks like we have a pretty even spread um, of all levels. And that, that's one of the things that uh, I just want to mention, um, you know, uh, our time together uh, is really going to have um, uh, application at all of those different levels. Um, just, a, just a quick uh, comment to uh, the chat. I certainly, certainly can work through how to set up a poll. I, I can tell you that is with a paid version of Zoom, although there are some other possibilities that you can have. Uh, poll Everywhere is another uh, third party um, way you can do some polling. Uh, so I can certainly help you one-on-one -on -one if you just want to stick around after the session. Um, and, and polling, if you do have the paid version of Zoom, uh, of Zoom, I can certainly help you how to set that up. It's super, super easy. Uh, and it's a great way to add some interactivity. Okay, so today's outcomes, I mentioned this a couple times, so I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but it's really what lessons can we learn from our quarantine experience as it relates to the teaching environment? And then probably most importantly, how do, can we... Um, uh, translate that moving forward? Um, how can we capitalize on these lessons that we've learned while they're fresh in our minds so that way we can not only improve our professional practice but ultimately impact kids uh, for the next school year? So uh, the first thing I want to talk just, uh, just a little bit about are our communication challenges. And a lot of these things we've lived, uh, we, we, we certainly have this experience uh, under our belts. 
Uh, but it's good to sometimes categorize that and lay it out uh, in, in sort of a, a methodic fashion. Uh, the first is that we certainly don't get to see our students or our colleagues on a daily basis. Uh, and now that things uh, may be lightening up a little bit, maybe you've been uh, you know, back to the building um, and you've seen some of your colleagues really over the past three months, it just has been totally different than it was before. And so those, those things you get when you see people in person on a daily basis are now all of a sudden missing. You don't get to pick up on the students' nonverbals. You don't get to see your colleagues. There's no more chance encounters that you get to have that conversation that maybe you didn't have, you wouldn't have otherwise. Um, so there's really has been a radical shift in how we communicate with one another. And unfortunately, uh, we, you know, humans are very social animals and we don't get a chance uh, to see each other in person as much as we would like to, or certainly not as much as we're used to. Uh, so those chance encounters have really been eliminated. The other thing that has really radically changed is how we communicate with parents. Uh, and when I say radically changed, it's not necessarily that we're not emailing parents um, or that we're not calling them, uh, but I would imagine that there's a lot more emailing and a lot more communication going on with parents because parents have now shifted into this supervisory world that maybe they're not used to. The other thing that you have to remember, and it's no doubt you thought about, uh, is now parents have an unprecedented level of access to what's going on in the classroom. Uh, and that's probably more true the younger you get. You know, if you have a first grader or a second grader getting on the computer, they're simply not as autonomous uh, as perhaps a sophomore in high school. Uh, but regardless of the age level, we have parents seeing all of what's going on and they can be a tremendous support uh, to what's going on in the classroom. But we really kind of have to think about how we approach instruction. Uh, in a way that not only communicates with students directly, but also parents. Um, the other thing uh, that we have to really think about, uh, and now that we've been through this for the past few months, we have a chance to kind of analyze what, what's happened. Uh, we have a chance to think about, maybe in a more systematic fashion, about how we manage our expectations. Uh, but managing expectations is a really important process because one thing that would be very detrimental to a classroom experience and is very detrimental to a professional experience, and I would even say personal relationships, is the idea of having a hidden expectation. If you have expectations for your students that you haven't communicated to them and they fail to meet those expectations, it's really going to cause a rift to occur in the classroom and by extension parents as well. Um, and I would even flip this around and talk about, uh, you know, perhaps with your building principal. If your principal has expectations of you they haven't communicated or you have expectations of your principal that you haven't communicated, and then you fail or someone fails to meet what those expectations are, it has a tendency to really create an alternate script that's not very productive. Uh, frustration builds um, and some negative emotions, and it can be bad for the relationship. So one of the things I wanna encourage you to think about is do I have expectations uh, that I have not communicated with my students, my parents, my colleagues, or my principal? And maybe those expectations are good about, I'm not talking about what the expectations are, I'm talking about whether or not they've been communicated. So we all know where we're all coming from. The, that's one of those elements that really is, it's a sort of a hidden element we don't necessarily think about right away. But when the in-person communication gets cut off like it has been, uh, that is one element that can really suffer because there are a lot of things we communicate uh, when we're in person that doesn't really translate to the distance environment all that well. And expectations can suffer uh, because of that. Um, another element of communication I think is pretty important, and I'm sure uh, uh, some of you have seen this before, um, but it's, and it's one of those things you've experienced but maybe haven't categorized uh, this way before. Um, it's the idea of having synchronous communication versus asynchronous communication. This idea really has come out of the IT world, uh, but it really has a lot of application in education. Synchronous communication is communication that happens in real time and requires an immediate response. What we're doing right now, for example, is synchronous communication. We are at the same place digitally uh, at the same time. Uh, so there's live communication and while um, I'm trying to manage my screen here, I can see your faces, you can see my face, it's all real time, we're talking in the chat, same place, same time. Asynchronous, I'm sorry, asynchronous communication, by contrast, is communication that doesn't happen in real time. Participants can send a response, but they do so on their own time. So a lot of the assignments that maybe we're assigning our students in Google Classroom or Schoology or whatever your platform happens to be, 
when you assign the assignment and the student is not right there with you and you're not teaching them and they're not seeing their, their face to face reactions, that is asynchronous. So the student will think about this on their own time. They'll work on this on their own time. They'll submit it to you on, on their own time. And then by, uh, by extension, you then uh, have the opportunity to assess and give feedback, uh, but it's all at different times. Uh, so that asynchronous, asynchronous communication is a challenge, uh, especially because when we are looking at what we're used to in the brick and mortar uh, uh, scenario, that brick and mortar classroom, that's synchronous, right? So you're sitting there, you're looking at your students, you see the puzzled look on their face. You know when one of your students just doesn't, they're just having an off day, right? They just don't, they don't look themselves. Maybe they, and maybe, you know, they, they have, there is a, a fight at home or there's, some, there's something that, that's weighing on them and you don't get to have that face-to-face -face conversation. So now that we've been stripped of that, um, and, and from an educational standpoint, how do we work around that? How do we still make the most of asynchronous? One of the things in the chat that was asked is Google Classroom asynchronous. And, and that Google Classroom is a good example of asynchronous communication. So you're, you're providing an agenda, you're providing your assignments, you post the assignments, the students are working on them, they submit that. It's all happening uh, at different times. Now, it might happen at the same time, but because you can't interact directly, there's no immediate feedback, um, that would be asynchronous. And again, asynchronous isn't bad, it's just different. Uh, and it, it doesn't have those things that we're familiar with. So uh, I'm just laid out, I'm not gonna read all of these to you because I sort of uh, explained them already, but synchronous communication has the advantage of being familiar. Uh, there's that real time, you can capitalize on those nonverbal cues, peers can collaborate, questions get answered quickly, and we all know how, fr how frustrating it is when we have questions that aren't answered right away. Uh, so that's something uh, just to be thinking about. Um, the disadvantage, however, to synchronous communication in a blended learning environment is that it's logistically difficult. And maybe you've run some of these sessions with your students. My daughter's in third grade and she had, um, you know, I think it was every Monday at like 11 or something, uh, she was meeting with her teachers uh, just in an online environment just to, just to catch up. Um, and it was about an hour. Um, but it's logistically difficult to make sure, especially if your student has multiple teachers. So maybe at the second grade level where perhaps they only have one teacher, that's different than maybe a, a high school sophomore who has six different teachers. So logistics can be a, a real uh, issue as well as time and attention constraints. Um, and we also have to be prepared for in a Zoom session or Google, Google, Google Hangout or Microsoft Teams, when you are communicating in this sort of environment, it's really, really weird because you're, you're not used to having somebody's face um, that close to you all the time. And so, you know, you're sitting here and you're looking at my face and I apologize for that, but it's just all you have and it's for an hour and it's just me and I'm talking this whole time. Uh, so that can be a real shift and perhaps you have, now you have some experience behind you, but then how do you translate that forward? We'll talk about that very shortly. Asynchronous communication does have some advantages, right? So students can access it anywhere, anytime. They can catch up on it later. They can read, they can reread. Or in the case of videos, they can watch, they can rewatch. Um, you can't replay live TV in real life. So um, that's something that you can have um, uh, uh, kind of taxing on your time. Uh, and you can also provide thoughtful, specific feedback. Not that you don't provide feedback already, but when you have that opportunity to think and, and really observe and reread the student, you can provide that feedback, which is a, certainly an advantage. The disadvantage, again, I talked about some of these delayed communication, it's unfamiliar, you don't get the immediate feedback. There's, uh, when we read things in text, we don't always get the, all the intended meaning behind that. Uh, so, um, and that lack of direct interaction can be a disadvantage. Uh, in the chat, we have someone who mentioned that it's challenging when a family has multiple children needing to use a device. And so that is a huge element that goes behind synchronous communication because if there's one computer or if there's one or two devices and maybe the internet speed isn't really working the way that it should be. And so again, that builds into that logistic and we almost have to have almost like this new term, this technological empathy, right? So we can really get behind what our students are experiencing. Okay, now, one of the things that we should be thinking about also is why do we want to connect with students? Now, that may seem like an obvious question at first, but I really want you to think about that for a moment. Why do we want to communicate? What is the purpose behind connecting with our students? So first, I think we have the obvious piece, right? We have the delivering instruction. I need to teach you this thing. 
I'm going to explain to you, I'm going to show you how, I'm going to whatever. We also want to connect with our students to provide us uh, assessment. How well are they? Where are they in the learning process? Do they get it? Do they not get it? Are there some, some ways to change that? Um, providing that feedback and managing those expectations. So and when I created this, I really was thinking about from the, from the instructional side, uh, but we also have the interpersonal and the emotional side as well. So students, uh, Debbie mentioned in the chat, establishing or keeping a relationship, and that is 100% true. We wanna connect with them because the relationship is so critical to the teaching um, uh, process. We wanna make sure that we maintain that as best we can, and that can be difficult. Um, and that's not only true just to, for, the, for uh, the, st the student and their achievement, but it's also for their overall well-being. Um, one element that has sort of suffered over the past three or four months is the, is the you know, the, the, that social emotional piece that students get when they're in the school. Um, and, you know, having been an administrator, I've seen a wide variety uh, of different social emotional uh, issues that students deal with. Uh, and that can be very challenging for them. So certainly the why behind connecting with students. But when we talk about why we want to connect with them, that often helps us to prioritize moving forward. Why did you want to think, why did you want to do this, and what are some other ways to accomplish the same why? Because the how is going to be shifting and has shifted. Uh, we also think about how often we communicate with students. We talk about uh, when, when is it necessary to have synchronous communication, and when can you use asynchronous communication? Um, is, it, is, is asynchronous better in some circumstances? So you got to be thinking about what are you teaching and how are you teaching it? And then how does that fit into this model? Uh, we also think about one-way versus two-way communication. Sometimes one-way communication is good, especially if you're showing a process and a student is able to watch or rewatch. Um, but sometimes two-way is good when maybe the student's trying it out for themselves. But keep in mind uh, that anything and everything that's communicated is also communicated directly with parents. So parents can be a very valuable resource because when we're, when we're explaining, you know, here's an assignment and I want you to do this thing, this section, and this section, when we're putting together the directions, we also want to make sure we're putting it in a way that makes sense to somebody uh, that maybe isn't the student. Uh, because the parent can be a tremendous support during that process because especially the younger we get and the less autonomous our students are so like pre-k one two three you know those grade levels the parent is going to have to be much more involved in, in helping the student get on their way uh, so when we make sure we're communicating with our students we're also communicating directly with the parent when it comes to those those elements so okay now that being said, I have a new chat box question for you. Um, someone mentioned this actually to build a relationship. I think uh, Debbie mentioned this in the chat uh, about build, establishing or keeping a relationship. So one of the things that's actually my next focus for my chat question is what are some ways that you've continued to build or maintained a sense of belonging during the distance learning experience? One thing that certainly suffered uh, is that when we have, um, we have a separation and geography when we're all at our own places like I mentioned before human beings are social animals so when we're separated like that one of the powerful elements behind having a classroom is you have the ability to control that environment and you have the ability that environment can be a very powerful impetus for student achievement um, when we're separated from each other sometimes that's that, that uh, can suffer so my question is what are some ways that you build and maintain a sense of community or identity belonging? Um, and, and one of the things I'm going to uh, move on to the next slide, and these chat questions are, are, are designed for you to continue to add. It doesn't have to be all answered before I move on to the next slide. Um, so that's uh, certainly a way that we can share resources with one another. Um, when we talk about connecting with students, um, you know, a typical classroom, we talk about building relationships. We talk about body language. Body language with a video, you're getting some of my facial expressions, and I really like to talk with my hands, so you might see them kind of flare up every once in a while, but a lot of body language you're not getting. Uh, so that's, in a typical classroom, you have that, it's different in a distance learning environment. Um, you have the opportunity in a typical classroom to kind of step out your communication, uh, meaning you can give direction one, wait 10 minutes, direction two, 10 minutes, so forth. When you're in a distance learning environment, you're sort of putting it all together, the whole kit and caboodle, so to speak, and the students, you know, kind of have to work through that on their own. Um, you have to give really abbreviated detail. If you, I'm sure you've received that email from that colleague that's like super long. And as soon as you open the email, you're like, oh my goodness, this is going to take me like five minutes to read. And so when we have 
uh, students that are reading through directions, we want to make sure that we're, we're giving bulleted points so that way they focus on the activity and they don't get overwhelmed from all the different types of communication that they're going to be receiving. Uh, some really great ideas being shared in the chats um, about having um, you know, sh uh, sending birthday cards to students. That's really awesome. Um, you know, uh, uh, April mentioned the kindergarten, her kindergartner's teacher would tell them ahead of time uh, what to bring as a show and tell. So those are, those, that's a really great idea. So some, some really cool things going on in the chat. So be sure to check that out. Um, we talk about communicating with the, uh, students in a digital format. So this is a new learning experience for many teachers, uh, for many educators. It was a new learning experience for me about creating content for an online world. Um, and one of the things that we've learned is that as you, as you kind of go through uh, and you communicate with one another, when you're reading online, you don't read paragraphs online. It's, it's a kind of an unusual experience to read paragraphs at a time. So like, my, like this slide is laid out, for example, it's, it's abbreviated, it's bulleted, and it has the important details. Uh, sometimes more detail is really necessary, but uh, one of the things I want you to keep in mind is that we wanna make sure that we keep things uh, organized for the reader. So that way they don't get overwhelmed with the information. If you think about how we get our news, we live, sort of get our news a lot in like the Facebook world or, or your news feed. You get a headline, you get a, uh, maybe a sub headline and you read maybe two or three sentences. And, and, and if you want to read more, you can, but it helps us to organize our life. One thing I created for you uh, here, uh, and I just want to make sure that you can see my screen. I think you can still see my screen. Yes, you can. Um, wait, no, you can't. Let me share this. Okay, okay. Uh, so here's an article, the, the Art of Scannable Content. I've included this link in the slide deck, so you don't have to write it down. You'll get this link emailed to you uh, as part of the slide deck. This is a, just a very quick article. It's a six minute read. That's, at least that's what they tell me. Maybe I would take an extra minute or two. Um, and this, if you kind of just look down, it kind of talks about how to put together readable writing uh, for uh, something on a computer screen. Um, and one of the things that maybe you've sort of kind of developed an understanding of is, especially if you have children of your own and, and those children are, 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 have multiple teachers, is that the student and the parents can very, very quickly become overwhelmed uh, with all of the communication coming home. So this article is just giving some pointers as far as how to uh, create effortless, readable uh, web content uh, so that way your students can maximize and get the most benefit out of it. Okay, just make sure that I'm sharing the correct screen with you. Uh, okay, there we go. I am. Okay, so um, something else about communication that's very, very important. And this is one of those things that maybe we don't learn it uh, until we kind of go through it. Uh, and maybe you have, and that's, that's terrific. Uh, but uh, it's the idea of having hold music. We've all called customer service before. We've all had the hold music uh, before. We know that hold music is one of those maddeningly frustrating experiences because you've been on hold forever. I don't know how much longer. Why am I still holding? But one of the valuable elements of hold music is it lets you know that you've not been hung up on. And so when we're all asynchronous, when we're all in our different places at our different times, it's important to keep the communication going, even if there's nothing new to communicate. I'm not saying you have to communicate or send something out every single day. I'm saying that you should be thinking about communicating on a regular basis, even if there's nothing new to communicate. What does that do? That lets the recipients know, that lets your audience know, your students, uh, it lets your, your parents know. For administrators, it lets teachers know that, the, that they've not been hung up on, that they're still being thought about, that they're, that they're still, um, uh, the, the hold music is going, that you've not been hung up on. Uh, it keeps everybody um, uh, on the same page as, okay, if, if there was new stuff, I'm going to hear about it. I know that there's regular communication going. And that can be very frustrating if you're on the recipient, right? Because if, um, if you don't hear the whole music, if you don't have regular communication, then you begin to wonder what's going on, right? Have I been forgotten about? What's going on? I don't know. And then people start to fill their own scripts and they begin to, to fill their own uh, holes. And you want to control that script, right? You don't want parents and students off on their own kind of thing, assuming, okay, well, this must be going on or this, I don't know what's, you know, and, and so this negativity can build up or confusion, frustration, 
we want to make sure that we continue uh, to provide that communication. So radio science is always filled with internal scripts. You just want to be the one providing the information to go in that script. Uh, so keeping that going. And the other thing to think about is active versus passive communication. When we want to communicate, we want to make sure that we're actively doing that. We're actively having the hold music going. Um, past communication is not bad. It's just different, right? Email me if you have a problem. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. That's sort of a passive communication. Active communication, maybe you do a weekly newsletter for your classroom. That's terrific. A Google Classroom or whatever your Schoology, whatever your platform is, as long as you're pumping out some sort of communication to give folks an update uh, that helps everybody to stay on the same page and it keeps the, the skids greased so that way you can really focus on the learning, not the environment surrounding the learning. Okay, uh, structure is very important, right? Structure provides security, it provides organization, it, buys, it builds buy-in. It, it goes a long way to, to maintaining culture. And in my time as an administrator, and then before that as a classroom teacher, uh, one of the things that I found is that having that structure really makes everybody much more comfortable. Uh, it releases anxiety, they know what's going on, they know what to expect, and that really helps to focus on, on really the most important thing, which is the learning. Uh, you manage expectations and you have that clear communication uh, flow. So having that structure is important. Uh, and so now I want you to think about, okay, where was I over the past three or four months? And then what did I learn as far as structure goes in my classroom? And how does that translate forward to next school year? Because we don't know that education is famous for all these acronyms and these little, like, these little idioms. Um, the, the one I heard most recently is brick to click. Um, and I, not, it just, I guess it rhymes, I guess that's a good thing. Uh, so whether we're gonna be in a brick and mortar or we're gonna be clicking online, um, the question is how can we provide structure for either scenario? Um, and then what did I learn from that? For you as an individual, for you as a professional, one of the things you should strongly consider is setting a purposeful schedule for yourself, uh, putting things in your calendar that maybe you don't always put in your calendar. Uh, for example, office hours, having that regular time that's expected and anticipated when you'll be available for questions or consultation. Um, one of the things, and hopefully we've, you know, if you haven't been done with school, if you're not done with your school year yet, you probably are very, very soon. And so um, what, what did you experience over that three or four months that I can say, okay, next year, I think I'm going to want to make sure I build in office hours ahead of time, or I'm going to want to make sure that I build in a time in my day. Maybe it's an hour where I can dedicate just to looking at emails. One of the things that I want to encourage you to avoid is checking your email at every five minutes uh, because odds are the, 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 you know, the whole, uh, it's not as urgent as you might think it might be. Uh, so um, you didn't work into the late hours of the night before this experience, and there's really not a reason to work into the late hours of the night moving forward. Maybe that happens once in a while, but you shouldn't be, uh, you know, just running yourself into the ground uh, with, without some sort, of, uh, some sort of systematic schedule. So when you set that schedule, you give yourself purposeful time, you're, you can stay on task, uh, and you're, you're, if you, matter of fact, if you're at home, one of the weird things you have to think about is even though you're physically in your dwelling or your place of residence or a familiar place, you still have to go home at the end of the day. That means you have to transition from your professional environment to your personal environment. And so you have to think about, okay, I need to put that on my schedule. When I was an administrator, that's what I did. I, put, I literally put go home on my calendar. I didn't always meet it, but I put, literally put it on my calendar because that was a reminder I have to make a transition. Um, because if, if you're an empty vessel, you're not in a place to fill anyone else. So you really have to maintain something that's going to give you long-term longevity uh, in this process. Um, it also gives space for reflection. Uh, reflection is critically important. And I want to encourage you now over the next week, take some time, an hour, two hours, and start writing some things down that you've thought of. Put them physically on paper or put them physically in your computer because if you write them down, the act of writing them down is going to help you to remember what those are and you can then come back and think about them. Okay, I remember we went through this and I don't want to forget this for next time because I don't want to make that same mistake or I'm gonna, I, I want to follow through with that improvement that I thought of or you know, this student really mentioned they had trouble with this assignment, I want to reward it. Uh, so whatever that happens to be, reflect on that. I can guarantee you reflection does not happen by accident. Um, and sometimes reflection happens at weird times, right? Maybe you just wake up in the middle of the night or maybe you think of it when you're getting, you know, your coffee in the morning. Uh, but build time on your calendar for that purposeful reflection.
Um, you also now will have, will have had some time to re-examine um, not only your teaching, but the actual lesson objectives themselves. And one of the things that hopefully you've seen is that maybe you had that favorite lesson activity, but it just didn't translate to the online environment. Like, and, and, and you know, you tried to do that rapid transition, we were all in a difficult spot, but when you made that shift, you're like, wow, that really just didn't work out like I thought it was gonna work out, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to make this change or that change. And so we really had to, in our minds, begin to think about what we're teaching versus how we're teaching it. And the what we're teaching is super, super important. The what we're teaching is, is that lesson objective. We'll talk more about this tomorrow. Uh, but we also have to think about how we're teaching it. Maybe it translates. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe I have to rethink about this activity, this really cool, great activity that I had with my students. Uh, and it's a group activity and they could collaborate, but it just doesn't translate. So uh, one of the things that we have to think about is the difference between what we're teaching versus what we're doing. Um, and those are, that's a big shift sometimes to really separate that out especially if you've been doing an activity for a long time and you've really fallen in love with the activity, that's great, but we can't lose sight of what that activity was supposed to teach and what the student ultimately should get from that. Okay, so I'm gonna throw up another poll here. Uh, this one has to do with the primary method for delivering instruction. Uh, so I'm kind of curious to see what has been over the past three or four months, what has been that primary method for delivering instructions to your students? Is this something that's happening in like in a written format? Maybe you communicate them via email, Google Classroom, Schoology, whatever. Um, do, are you delivering your instruction uh, via some sort of synchronous communication, Google, Google Hangout, Microsoft Teams, Zoom? Are you filming yourself? Are you become the star of your own TV show and you're now you know, providing those videos to students? Uh, are using some other platform. Uh, so I'm kind of curious to see where folks are with respect to the primary method for delivering that instruction. So I'm gonna give you a few more seconds here. I have about 48% of us have voted. Give you just a few more seconds uh, and then I'll share the results with you um, and you can see uh, where folks are in our group. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling in three, two, one. Now I'll go ahead and share the results with you. So it looks like about half of us uh, are doing some sort of written format, uh, some sort of asynchronous communication. We can use our new word there, right? So email, worksheet, classroom, school, whatever. Um, looks like some of us have really tried, uh, about a third of us have tried to do the synchronous lessons. Some are doing some videos. Uh, and those are all good. That gives us a sense as to where we, uh, where we are. And I realize you've probably done a mixture. This is probably not all one thing. I realize that. But I want to think about, okay, what was that primary method? What was my go-to? And the question is, is that the best way to do it moving forward? Maybe you had great experience with it. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you thought, well, if I could do this again, I would change this, that, or the other thing. Maybe I would do a video. Or maybe I would really, this is really worth us getting together, same place, same time to talk about. Uh, and we don't know what next year is going to look like. It looks like, at least right now, we'll probably have some sort of mixture, but really we don't know 100% what next year is going to look like. We may start off online, then go in person. We may start in person, go online. We may be doing some sort of hybrid right off the bat. Whatever that case happens to be, I want you to spend some time now reflecting on, okay, what was my experience last time? And then what, what, what's, is it really the best way to start off um, now that I have a, a fresh start? Now, Something else to think about, and we can't lose sight of this either, is that you started off the at-home learning experience um, with the, what, second part of third quarter or fourth quarter, uh, and that was really the, the, the whole of it. Um, that was a different set of standards than you're gonna be teaching at the beginning in, uh, of next year. So uh, something to think about there uh, is that, okay, these topics that I cover in March, April, and May, I, I have some good sense, but what can I take from those so when I go to the beginning of the year and start off, start off a whole year, start off a whole grade level. So when you're deciding how to deliver instruction, you have to decide what to deliver. And we're gonna spend some time tomorrow talking about this in, in some more detail. Uh, but we wanna take some time and reflect on what to teach. How did, how did that align with the standards? How did that align with what the course is or the grade level or the subject area is? Um, if I'm doing third grade, uh, reading, how is that 
you know, what are those elements of third grade reading um, and how is that separated from those things uh, that I use to teach that? I'm a high school guy. I have a lot of experience at the high school level. Uh, and one of the things, you know, uh, that some English teachers, To Kill a Mockingbird, that's a pretty popular high school level text. Uh, and some teachers love teaching To Kill a Mockingbird. The question is, are we teaching To Kill a Mockingbird or are we teaching other standards using To Kill a Mockingbird? Uh, and that really the book can change, the activity can change, what we're learning can't. That is, that is constant. I have to learn these items, these objectives, but that utility, that piece we use to do it, that can change. So we should spend some time now thinking about and separating out the what from the how. Uh, we also want to make sure uh, that we're clear that what this helps us to do is build some clarity into what we're teaching. Because when we shift to the online environment, if we want to be super effective in that digital environment, we have to be uber clear on what standard we're teaching. And then we also have to know what it means to have learned that thing. So for example, if I'm teaching students on how to add fractions, I need to be very clear on what it means to A, learn how to add fractions, but I also need to be very clear on how do I know that students can do it. In the case of adding fractions, that might be simple. Here's two fractions, can you add them or can't you? But if you're doing something maybe a little bit more nuanced, perhaps like identifying theme or main character in a story, if you're doing something like, what does it mean to have learned about theme? Theme, when you talk about the theme of a story, that's one thing to say it. But if, if you ask a student, hey, did you learn theme? Do you know what theme is? What is it you're looking back from that student to say, okay, yes, they've got it. So we have to think about what does it mean to teach theme? And then what does it mean to have learned theme? Uh, and we have to kind of separate those two ideas out in our heads. So that way, when we're delivering that instruction, we can be very clear on what that is. We don't want to get in the trap of, let's say, I'm going to teach theme by reading Peter Cottontail and then get caught up in the, in the, the details of Peter Cottontail and we lose sight of what uh, theme is all about. So we want to make sure that we're very, and what that does is it helps us to build clarity, right? It helps you to communicate to the students what they should learn and how they know they've learned it. It helps you to communicate to parents what it is they should be learning and how they know they've learned it. Uh, and one of the things, one of the illustrations that I like to use is does it pass the dining room table test? So for example, let's say we have the family, they're sitting around a dining room table and uh, the parent asks the, the student, what did you learn today? Would the student respond, would they respond with what they did or what they learned? For example, oh, well in math class we did a worksheet, but that's not what they learned, that's what they did. Oh, well we learned how to add fractions. And then the ultimate example, and this will just make you fall over with joy, I can, I can just tell, is that you say, I learned how to add fractions by using a worksheet. Now I realize it's pie in the sky, but we want students to say that, right? We want them to say, hey, I learned fractions by doing a worksheet. Uh, but the learning is the key. Here are some elements that I think um, might be helpful for you. When we create a lesson for the distance environment, we have to think about several things, right? We have to think about what's that home environment like? Um, do they have access to the right technology? What level of support do they have? What level of collaboration is available to them? Um, those are some things that really kind of have to be on that, that checklist when we're building a lesson or activity. So that way we can go uh, and we're not putting students in a, in a weird spot where, well, I'm supposed to do this, but I don't have that. Or I don't have, you know, I don't have this technology or I don't, there's no parent to help me do this or, or, or other support person to help me do this, whatever the case might be. I have included at the bottom, I'm not going to click on them now, but I have included at the bottom uh, some tools for you uh, that come from all the different professional, uh, the subject area organizations for each of the four core content areas. Uh, and each one of these links will take you directly to a website. Uh, each one of those four core content put together um, some resources for doing blended learning. Uh, so I just want to put that direct link. And there's a lot of really great things in there, things that will help you to build your own lessons, sample lessons for you to use, a whole variety of things. So I just wanted to provide that resource for you. Okay, another poll. Um, I want to kind of get a sense as far where we are with regard to assessment. 
So one of the things that's probably been a bit challenging uh, is number one is getting students to complete work. I realize that's been an issue um, that, you know, and, and, and maybe it's been more of an issue with older students, at least that's what I've been hearing anecdotally, is that, well, students aren't just, they're not showing up to my Zoom session. I think someone even mentioned that in the chat. Um, or they're just, they just didn't turn in the project or whatever the case might be. Um, so when students don't do the work, it's hard to assess the work. But let's say for the purpose of this poll, what are we using to assess students? And I, when I say assess, I don't mean assign grades. When I say assess, I mean you as the teacher measuring where that student is on that learning continuum. Are they still in the early stages? Are they you know, making some good progress with some key areas they need to work on? Do they, have they mastered it? Whatever the case might be. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and give you just a few more seconds to answer that poll. And I realize you probably are doing more than one of these. I realize that. I wanna get a sense as far as where you are um, primarily. What has your, been your go-to assessment type? Uh, for assessing students. So I'm going to go ahead and shut down the poll in three, two, one, and I'll go ahead and share the results with you. It looks like most of us, about a third of us, have been doing some sort of student work submission. Uh, and that's not surprising. That's We've run this session before, and that's that's been the primary one as well. We also have some online quizzes, uh, maybe some synchronous student meetings. If you, can, if you can swing those, those are really, really great because you get that live interaction, but they're really, really difficult logistically. Um, and then some haven't really done assessment, and that's, that's not surprising either. That's been a really challenging environment. Now, that being said, moving forward into next school year, how are we going to do the assessment? Because the assessment is not an optional piece, right? We have to assess our students. And again, it's not... Um, it's not about giving grade. Grades are important. I'm not saying grades are unimportant, but the assessment is, is more than that, right? It's you measuring where they are, and it's you also being in a spot to provide them feedback. That's going to be Chris's, Chris and Kelly's session primarily on Wednesday. They're going to talk about assessment and feedback. Um, I want to make sure I take that. Um, take the results down so they don't clutter your screen there. Okay. Um, but assessment and feedback, when we talk about assessment, I think there might be a little, I'm not sure, there's a little bit of red mark on the slide there. I don't know where that came from, that's interesting. Uh, again, assessment's not about grades, it's about what do my students know, what are they able to do, and it also leads to feedback. Whether that's formative or summative, uh, whatever the assessment is, it's gonna provide you an opportunity to give the student feedback. And I would say, from my vantage point, the most important part of the learning process is feedback. It's providing students some sort of measurement of where they are in the learning continuum and specific to their situation. Uh, in the same way, when you have you know, somebody providing you feedback when you're learning something new, um, that allows you to have some good sense, uh, what's next? What do I do next? What do I have to do to improve? Uh, so um, I'm gonna throw this out there as a chat box question. Uh, I'm not gonna spend time uh, this, at this moment uh, talking about the answers. We'll, we'll kind of reflect on this here in a few minutes. Uh, but what are some ways that uh, you've assessed your students along their learning journey? Are, are there certain tools that you use? Uh, I know that there's uh, some, some folks that have been like Class Dojo I see in the chat. Um, some people are trying to use uh, Zoom. Um, uh, whatever the, the case might be, maybe you're using Flipgrid or, or maybe Padlet or a variety of different resources. I just want to invite you to share that in the chat. So looking forward, uh, these are four questions that I want to just very touch on in our last few minutes together, is what have I learned throughout my distance teaching experience? So that's the first question here. What have we learned? Teaching is going to be different next school year, and it's probably going to be beyond that for quite some time. Regardless of what your classroom looks like, what have you learned that will translate? And I can't answer that question for you, but I want to invite you to reflect on that. Also, you should build time into your day. Not only should you build it now, but you should plan on that next year. Um, right off the bat, Friday is going to be my reflection day. Thursday is going to be my reflection day. I'm going to spend one hour. Maybe it's your planning period. Maybe it's going to be right after school. Maybe it's going to be a time at home. I don't know. But put some time into your day where you can reflect on, okay, what did I, how did that go, and how can I make it better? Um, or what went well, and what can I share with other people? Uh, so uh, that's, those are some things you should really be thinking about. But unless you're uh, unless you are um, uh, intentional behind that, it's not going to happen, right? It's one of those things you put on the wish list and you never get to, and then it doesn't benefit anybody. So I will encourage you to keep reflection and put that on your calendar. Um, how is quarantine, and when by quarantine, I don't mean the actual quarantine experience, I mean the blended distance digital learning experience. What has that done to make you more purposeful in what objectives you're trying to teach? Have you realized that, well, 
there are some things I've been teaching before. I guess I really don't need those. It's not the most important element or, or maybe this part is really the, the critical piece. And now that we're at a distance, I kind of shaved off some of the, some of the stuff that maybe I've done before. It's not as important. Uh, so what have you done and record those, write them down, take advantage of this teachable moment for yourself and write them down. And then more importantly, what's going to change next year? Have that same sort of critical mindset moving into next school year so that way you can have that same approach to all of your lessons. What can, you, what, what can be better as a result of this experience? Uh, how has it changed your approach? So not just the what you're teaching, but how you're teaching it. We really should be able to ultimately over the course of the next school year, be in a position where we can plug and play. You can tell me, hey, Monday you're at home, what are you doing to teach this? Tuesday you're in the building, what are you doing to teach this? And I don't wanna be flip, I know that it's more complicated than that. But you should have in your mind a bank of activities and strategies that work in an online environment best, and then a bank of activities and, and experiences that work in a, in a brick and mortar best. Um, and sometimes they might be the same activity, but sometimes they may not. If you're that history teacher who teaches the War of 1812 and you have kids stand up and stand around the room and, and you have them pretend to invade each other, I don't know what, I'm not a history teacher, I'm a math teacher, uh, but if you have them do, maybe that's the best way to teach that. And I'm not going to argue with that. You're the expert and you know, but that doesn't really work in an online environment. So we should have some sort of bank activities. And as we go, we begin to build that, right? You remember the hardest year you had teaching was probably your first year, two year, three years, but it got better. Why did it get better after that? Well, because you learned and you built and you added to a library of things you could do. Unfortunately, we're in that position where we have to do that right in the middle of our, our careers, but we have to really think about building that bank. What are those good activities and how do they go? Um, also, what have you learned about communicating? So this is not just communicating with parents and students, but communicating with colleagues, communicating with your administrator. What are, what are those nuances that you've kind of picked up on? Well, it turns out maybe when I'm writing something, I'm going to write it in this way because it's the most clear and has the least amount of emotion. Um, whenever we communicate in written format, we want to keep uh, as best we can emotion out of that uh, because uh, emotion never translates through text very well. Um, also, and, and maybe you've learned this before, maybe this is the first time you're hearing it. If you're angry, don't write the email. Trust me on that. Um, if you're angry, let that kind of to, to settle down or frustrated, let that settle down to collect your thoughts and then send the written communication. Uh, that way you're very clear and you send what you really need to communicate. Uh, but we also need to think about, okay, how is this going to translate? How is this going to translate uh, not only with my colleagues, uh, but also uh, with students, parents, and administrators. Um, there's a lot of unknowns for next year. So I realize you, you know, whatever plan we put together is probably going to change, but I want you to start thinking about, okay, what are those things, those non-negotiables um, that, that have to happen regardless? So there's a lot of unknowns. Your students and your families are looking to you and they're looking to your, your building principal uh, or maybe your district administration for some reassurances. When it comes down to it, they're gonna to look to you about your class. My teacher is there for me, and they're, they've assured me that we're gonna get through this together. That, you know, that there's, that while we, there's still some question marks, I know that I'm in good hands because I know this teacher's not gonna leave me behind. And those, those students and those families are looking to you for that reassurance. Uh, so remember, keep the whole music going, keep the communication going. Keep the positivity included. There's lots and lots of time for negativity and, and, and goodness sakes, we know that's true, just look around, right? But for next school year, when it comes to your classroom, keep that, celebrate the positives and make sure you include that as part of your process. Remember the whole music here. Um, also, take care of yourself, right? Working in a distance uh, learning environment, I mentioned this before, make sure you go home, right? Um, just because you're working in your home doesn't mean you don't still have to go home. Uh, and you still have to take care of yourself. Um, there's a protocol called the Sweet 16. That means when you're done with your day, whatever that day starts or ends, I don't know, whatever requirements you have to fulfill, when that's done, take 16 minutes for yourself. Maybe that means cooking dinner. Maybe that means playing with your kids. Maybe that means exercising. Maybe that means walking the dog. Maybe that means I don't know. But have 16 minutes, you're not checking your email. You're not on the phone with somebody. You're not, you know, you, you know, perseverating on this problem that you've been trying to, to solve. Take 16 minutes, the world will survive, and you'll be better for it. Um, because remember, 
um, if you have an empty vessel, there's really nothing left to give. Uh, and so uh, that's very important. Last poll for today, um, and I'm gonna throw this out there. This is really as much for me as it is to share the results with you. Um, I wanna get a sense as far as where you are with your Zoom abilities. And something that's interesting, um, and by Zoom, I don't necessarily mean Zoom. I mean Google, uh, Google Hangouts or Microsoft Teams or whatever the case might be. What is your comfort level in that zone? And one of the things that I've seen, I'm gonna see if it bears, bears out to be the case here, uh, is that maybe over the course of the past three or four months, you've really begun to build that skill set. The question is, moving forward, now that you've identified those areas that you might need a little bit more work in, what are you going to do to fill those potholes, right? And so I'm not the best at doing, you know, uh, creating a Google uh, Classroom activity and getting it. What are you going to do between now and next school year that's going to fill that gap? There's lots and lots and lots of resources available for you. Uh, but remember, we're taking personal time for reflection. We're purposeful. We're intentional. And now we're going to put those into action. Uh, so I'm going to give you just a couple more seconds here. Three, two, one. And I'm going to share those results with you. It looks like about half of us are comfortable, but we still have things to learn. We have a pro in the room. That's excellent. I'm not going to ask you to, to identify yourself, but I'm glad you're a pro. I'm glad you can train others. I invite you uh, to reach out to your principal and say, hey, is there any way I can be of help and, and help other people? Uh, one person is barely treading water with this format. Believe me, we were all there. All of us, every single one of us have been in a place where we're just learning it. So hang in there, you'll get better. Uh, but let's all be intentional about moving the ball down the field and being uh, better next year as a result of this uh, teaching experience. Uh, so upcoming sessions. Tomorrow, uh, it'll be myself. It'll also be my colleague, Jennifer Morgan. Uh, and we're going to talk about how to prioritize instruction, separating the how from the what. Uh, in a blended learning classroom. And then Wednesday, Chris and Kelly are gonna talk about assessment and feedback. Uh, and so uh, we're hope, I certainly hope you're able to join us. Uh, I certainly hope that you've had a, a valuable time today. And I'm gonna end here uh, with uh, just my contact information, all of our contact information. If I've said something uh, that you'd like to know more information about or have questions, feel free to shoot me an email um, and I'll get back to you uh, and support you in whatever way I can. Um, and then uh, following this session, you will receive a recording. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, you'll also get a copy of the slide deck. You'll also get a copy of the chat. So if somebody said something in the chat, you'll get a copy of that as well. Uh, and then uh, I'm also going to stick around after the session is over in case you'd like to ask any questions or interact in any other way. Uh, but I'm going to call an official close to our time together now. Uh, again, I hope you had a, a, a time to uh, really kind of you know, give some time to some, some thinking and, and hopefully uh, I hope you have a, a great rest of the school year. If you're still not done, if not, enjoy your summer. I know you're going to be working hard uh, and I wish you the best for next school year. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and close. Thank you.